More than two decades ago, I was a kid reporter at CBC Television trying to learn from the veterans how the job was done. One of those veterans I admired so much was David Halton. He was so solid, unbiased, and a great storyteller with gravitas I could only dream of having. I knew David's father, Matthew, was also a correspondent, but frankly didn't know that much about him. That is not the case any longer. Dispatches from the front. Matthew Halton, Canada's voice at war, is David Halton's biography of his father and consistent with David's journalistic practice. It is a solid, unbiased look at Canada's greatest war correspondent, and David Halton joins us now here at TVO. It's so great to see you again. Pleasure to be it's here. It's been a long, long time. Let's just yeah. go through a bit of a checklist here. Sheldon, if you wouldn't mind, let's bring this up. Because, uh, I mean, one of the reasons you wrote this book is that not too many people know who your dad is or not enough people mm -hmm. remember who your dad is. So let's remember that he was born the 7th of September, 1904, in Pincher Creek, Alberta, mm -hmm. a London correspondent by age 28. Married Jean Campbell, your mom, in 1932, had three kids, one of whom is sitting beside me right now. Mm -hmm. He was Canada's most notable war correspondent for both the Toronto Star and then the CBC. King George VI awarded him the Order of the British Empire. And here's the really sad part of the story. He died December 3rd, 1956, only at age 52. David, I want to start by asking you what the following people have in common. Here's a little pop quiz, okay? Franklin Roosevelt, Herman Goering, Neville Chamberlain, Josip Braz Tito, Charles de Gaulle, David Lloyd George, King George VI, Mahatma Gandhi, Albert Einstein, Marlena Dietrich, Douglas Fairbanks, Lenny Riefenstahl, John Gilgood, George Bernard Shaw, H.G. Wells, Babe Ruth. What do they all have in common? They were all interviewed by Matthew Halton, or Matt, as he was familiarly known. And when you look at that roster of, of famous interviews, you say, my, my goodness, if you'd had one or two uh, prime ministers or presidents in your life, you were lucky. But uh, wow, I mean, that covered the spectrum of sports, of uh, theater, arts, literature, and above all, politics. Uh, interviewing Hermann Goering, my goodness. Amazing. Uh, I'm going to uh, suggest, though, that it didn't start all that glamorously for him. And uh, again, a little blue language here, so if the kids are listening, but this is right out of the book. Who was Shithouse Halton's son? <laughs> My father was the son of a, an impoverished miner from Lancashire in England who emigrated to Canada on the promise of a free homestead, like a lot of people. Uh, gets out to southern Alberta, is given the spectacular uh, acreage right up against the Rockies, but coming from a mining family, he has no idea how to ranch. So uh, he gives up on the, uh, the ranch after a while, moves into a little town called Pincher Creek, desperately looking for a job, and the mayor says, well, unfortunately, Mr. Halton, the only job we have right now is the honey wagon man. And the honey wagon man was a polite euphemism for the chap who went around with a horse-drawn carriage cleaning out the outdoor privies, because, of course, no one had flush toilets. So he became known uh, rapidly as Shithouse Halton. <laughs> and, and my father at school was uh, uh, mercilessly teased, oh, here comes Shithouse Halton's son. <laughs> so it was, uh, it was that kind of upbringing. I can't believe you just said that word on television <laughs> twice, but it's great. Uh, this is really extraordinary. A man in love. Here's an excerpt from your book. If there is really a purpose in the universe, then I know that a million years ago, a thousand eons removed, it was decreed that I love you. If, on the other hand, there is no purpose and we are just creatures of chance, I still know this. That chance has defeated its own ends and made a purpose for me. That purpose is to love you. That's a love letter your dad wrote to your mom. What did you think when you first read that? Well, it was fascinating. I knew that they had a, a wonderful marriage. Uh, they met, of course, at the University of Alberta. And coming from very different backgrounds, my, my dad coming from this very poor Pincher Creek family, uh, Jean Campbell came from the kind of the bourgeoisie of Alberta at the time. Uh, and, uh, and yet they had this wonderful uh, courtship. And, uh, and then, of course, a marriage, a, and a wonderful marriage. Uh, uh, my sister and I often remarked uh, after my father's death that we never heard voices raised in anger. Hmm. Uh, it was a great marriage, and yet at the same time, uh, it showed a, a certain tolerance from, on my mother's part for the fact that uh, Matthew Holton, my dad, was quite a heavy drinker. In fact, he was a prodigious drinker at times. And in the five years he was away from my mother uh, during the war, he had a certain number of affairs. But in a way, it seemed uh, not quite the open marriage as we define it today, but uh, a certain tolerance level there, which is quite remarkable. Well, since you've touched on it, I was going to get to that later, but since you've touched on it, um, why write about that? Why write about the fact that your dad had affairs? 
Well, I, I, when I set out writing the book, Steve, I was determined that this wouldn't be a hagiography, that it would be a book that uh, talked about the failings of my father, both as, uh, as a journalist and as a, and as a human b being. So I wanted to be rigidly objective about that. And um, these affairs were kind of part of his wartime experience. Uh, one notably where he's one of the first journalists to go into liberated Paris. And the person who helps guide him through the city when the fighting is still going on is a blonde young French resistance fighter uh, named Christian de Saint-Fort. Uh, and my father quickly discovers that she was, uh, had been an actress before the war. She loved uh, uh, English romantic poetry of the, of the uh, 19th century. So they were almost destined to become lovers <laughs> in the next few days. So, I mean, that was part of his wartime experience. And, uh, I felt it would have been uh, gi giving him short shrift in a way, uh, unless I discussed uh, uh, issues like that. Your mother knew. Well, she she knew. He wrote these wonderful letters. My father's fifteen twenty pages long, two or three times a week. A great source for a biographer. Indeed, I wonder today how biographers of the future will work with tweets and, and emails <laughs> and so on. So this was a wonderful source, and he would talk about going out with some of these uh, these ladies. Uh, not many, two or three, uh, during the course of the war. Uh, he wouldn't say he was having an affair with them, but he. Uh, he made it. He kind of telegraphed the fact that he had uh, he wasn't uh, totally faithful to. And my she mother. didn't seem to mind. She didn't seem to mind. Remarkable. Did you, Did you know about any of this when you were? You know, no, no, I didn't. Younger, I, I discovered these uh, these in the in the antiseptic surroundings <laughs> of the uh, the National Archives, opening box after box, and in one one box I opened, a cascade of letters of love letters from this French resistance fighter came out, and, and there it was. You know, it was a very strange uh, feeling, a bit troubling, a bit voyeuristic on my part. To, my, my, my dad did this and he met this person. Did uh, it bother you to find uh, this out about your dad? It, 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 it is slightly troubling at first, but it didn't really bother me. No, I can't say it did. Let's talk about the drumbeat of war. He was uh, one of the most outspoken um, Political reporters at the time, war correspondents at the time. Well, it's not quite war yet, but it's war is coming. Uh, a series he did on Germany and the increasing bellicosity of Hitler's Germany. What reaction did he get to those pieces? Well, that was one of my great surprises in writing the book. Uh, I thought he would have be acclaimed as prophetic and so on, writing these uh, books sounding the alarm about Hitler and Nazi Germany. But in fact, he was widely attacked in Canada at the time as being a warmonger. And as a sensationalist, uh, the Roman Catholic Archbishop of Toronto had, uh, advised his readers not to buy the Toronto Star, where he was being published. Um, and in fact, at that time, and again, it was something of a revelation to me, uh, uh, Hitler was, was acclaimed by a lot of people in Canada. The Globe and the Montreal Gazette wrote a series saying that uh, Hitler was a great force for stability. Uh, in, in Germany, they said these stories of persecution of Jews and dissidents were quote unquote imaginative lies. And so uh, my father was to some degree a lone voice of the star, along with the Winnipeg uh, Free Press, which was the other uh, newspaper which was very uh, anti-Hitler. But um, they, they were very much lone voices. And even someone like Walter Lippmann, this famous American journalist, uh, I wrote a column that I read saying that uh, Hitler was a, a force for uh, peace and stability in Germany. Hmm. The Canadian socialist Frank Underhill said, European troubles are not worth the bones of a Toronto grenadier. How frustrating was that attitude to your dad? I think it was very much uh, uh, frustrating because he was a, a huge supporter of the League of Nations and wanted the League of Nations to use its limited sanctions to uh, put pressure on both uh, Mussolini's Italy and Hitler's Germany. Uh, not to expand, not to pursue their aggressive uh, ambitions. Uh, but of course, it didn't work. And we had Mackenzie King as the prime minister then, who, uh, again, a, somewhat of a surprising discovery for me. I, I, I'd always thought of him as following Neville Chamberlain in Britain and his appeasement policy. But uh, King was very much in the vanguard of the appeasement movement. He went to see Hitler, uh, found Hitler deeply impressive, as he shows in his diaries. Mm -hmm. All this was, was quite shocking to me. He describes Neville Chamberlain after the Munich agreement. We think of Munich as a synonym for a sellout to, to tyranny. Uh, uh, but at the time, Munich was hailed by most people as a great, great event. Peace in our time. Peace in our time. A a and um, King describes Neville Chamberlain as one of the greatest statesmen he's ever met. 
And a year later, he describes another man, you can guess, Winston Churchill, as uh, one of the most dangerous politicians. Oh, and, and, a, and a big bore, too. They had yeah. a terrible first meeting. Did your dad ever have it out with Mackenzie King and try and set him straight? Uh, I don't think that he met him after the war, and th they may have had a, a conversation, but I don't think that he, uh, he actually upbraided mm. him in public. Uh, you know, everybody who's ever covered Hitler, you know, as a news mm. story, who was there and would have seen him, uh, you know, always has that moment where they ask themselves, if I could have killed him, should I have and spared the world from? Did your dad, do you know, have one, a moment like that? He did on a number of occasions, especially during the 1936 Olympics in Berlin, where the press stand was just behind where Hitler and uh, uh, a number of leading Nazis were sitting. And he'd often reflect afterwards that if he had the courage to throw a hand grenade in the right place, uh, he could have uh, saved the world uh, vast uh, agony. So he, he had that reflection on a number of... Uh, a number of occasions. It's a bit cheeky of me to ask the son to um, read something that the father broadcast, but um, he's not here and you are, so I am going to ask you. This is a dispatch that your father broadcast at 5 in the morning on the 4th of July, 1940, in France. And I wonder if I could prevail upon you to read it. This was at the uh, Battle of Carpique. Uh, where he was told in advance that he should go up to the front, be with the frontline troops to witness this, uh, the Canadian troops advancing from the front line. And uh, he writes, and now 25 minutes have passed, 25 minutes of the most, I think the most ferocious barrage I've ever seen. All we can see is smoke and the terrible bursts of flame as one of the huge naval shells falls on the enemy position. Occasionally an enemy shell falls near us, and you can hear, as I speak, you can hear the chattering, the hard stuttering of the machine guns. And he goes off to sign off. This is Matthew Holton of the CBC speaking from France. I got chills listening to that. It puts you there, doesn't it? It does indeed. Why do you think your father loved doing that so much? Well, he was passionately involved. He was, uh, to some degree, a, a crusader in the 30s, a crusader against fascism when he was a lone voice and ultimately vindicated. Um, I think he, he loved the profession. Uh, he loved, obviously, meeting uh, famous people whom he admired. Um, you know, I, I was only 16 when my father died, but uh, I remember the house being full of scintillating characters from the press, from politics, uh, veterans, and I think some of that wore off on me to a degree. And, uh, you know, I was at 16, you're more interested in girls and supporting the local football game. But uh, I think that atmosphere and the, his passionate intensity for, for what he was doing, uh, some of that rubbed off on me as well. Clearly. We'll get to more of that yeah. in a second. But, uh, you know, he, he clearly was horrified by what he saw, some of the carnage that he saw during World War II. But it must have also excited him to be kind of in the biggest story in the history of the world, and he had a front row seat for it, yes? Oh, very much so. And I think he started, his first war was the Spanish Civil War. Uh, he, w he was in Spain in 1936, and he went to the front for the first time, and he was terrified. And he, he recounted later that he actually vomited and, and, and tried to get as far as he could from where the fighting was going on. In the Western Desert, in the battle leading up to the Great Battle of Alamein, uh, he manages to conquer that fear and uh, develops almost an exhilaration to be at the front, a, a heightened sense of living when you're, you're close to death. And I think at times it bordered almost on the perverse. You know, it, it got to be a habit. He would get to the front. Part of it was a macho thing of overcoming the fear. Part was a feeling that if he was reporting on Canadian troops at the front, uh, he had to share some of their experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, he would make a very strong point of, of wanting to be at the front with them to tell his viewers what they were feeling and what they were doing. But once the war is over and you've now finished covering the greatest story of all time, how do you, how do you find meaning in life and in work after that? Well, you know, he, uh, after the war, he became the CBC's chief London correspondent. Uh, he got the Order of the British Empire from King George VI. He sort of became Mr. Canada in London. He did a lot of BBC work. Uh, and it should have been a very happy time, and to a degree it was, but there was also a distinct sense that he was on 
a downward slope in life, that when you've um, landed with the assault troops in, in, in D-Day, when you've gone into Paris during its liberation, when you've been at the great battle of Ortona in Italy, when you've been in Berlin to witness the, the surrender, everything after that to a degree is, is a bit anticlimactic, mm -hmm. uh, even if you're covering important political events. So I think that weighed on him a little bit. And uh, there was a sense, as I say, that uh, almost nostalgia for the, the comradeship and some of his friends he made during the war and for the covering these great events as opposed to the more prosaic ebb and flow of, of political events in London you know, after the war. You know this question is coming. You've outlived your dad by almost a quarter of a century, and you had a very long and distinguished 40-year career as a correspondent yourself. How much of that 40 years did you spend comparing yourself to him? Well, this will strike you as strange, but not a great deal. Since I was 16 when he died, a 10-year hiatus before I went into uh, to journalism, um, he was constantly in the back of my mind. I'd go to a lot of places. I stayed in many hotels where he stayed. I remember being in Cairo uh, at one point and actually asked to stay in the same room in Shepherd's Hotel that he stayed in. So I was a very uh, aware of it, but I can't say that it was um, intimidating because of this as I say, this 10-year time lag after he, he died. I should ask you about Edward R. Murrow, because Edward R. Murrow it has this sort of sainted reputation in the United States as great wartime correspondent, this is London, and so on, and there's foundations named after him, and, you know, he's, he's got a great reputation down south. Your dad's the Edward R. Murrow of Canada, but this being Canada, he doesn't have that same sainted reputation. Does that tick you off? Uh, it, it does indeed, and, and that's one of the reasons, I guess, that prompted me to write this book. When I got back from Washington and retired uh, 10 years ago, uh, I found that, you know, my father's name, legendary in his time, as you say, he was called Count de Zed Marot. Uh, he was, had probably a, a higher international profile than any Canadian journalist mm -hmm. has had before or since. Uh, he was named by the British Publicists Association as one of the six best correspondents writing in the English language at the time, you know, I get back from Washington and find that apart from a dwindling number of the World War II generation, uh, Matthew Halton is a forgotten name. And what really troubled me is going to journalism schools that do the odd lecture across the country. And uh, the students had all heard of and tell you a lot about Ed Murrow, but they had no idea about who Matthew Halton was. So that was really what got me going in the hope that I could re reawaken some interest in a, in a, a correspondent whom historians like Jack Granitstein have described as uh, Canada's greatest uh, war and foreign correspondent. Hmm. David, I have one more question for you, and that is, how personally sad is it for you that the one person I presume you would love to have read this book is never going to read this book? Well, th there is an element of sadness there because, uh, you know, the whole honor thy father syndrome uh, is there, and that's certainly what makes me proud to have written this book. and particularly proud of him, obviously. Uh, so that is uh, sad, but I think somewhere up there he might be giving a small cheer as well. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Uh, I loved it. Thank you yeah. very much for writing it. Pleasure. Dispatches from the Front, Matthew Halton, Canada's Voice at War, by his son David Halton. So good to see you again, David. Thanks so much. Thanks for being here, Steve. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.